funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. In December 1846, during the height of the Great Irish Famine, an American woman named Astrid Nicholson arrived into Ireland. Her mission was to try alleviate and bear witness to Irish famine suffering, as well as to publicise the plight of the Irish poor to the outside world. Professor Christine Keneally, Director of the Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. Asneth Nicholson was born in New England. When she heard about the famine, she decided to come and help the poor in any way she could. And that's indeed what she did. So she based herself in Dublin. She opened a soup kitchen funded by donations from her friends in America in Cook Street in the centre of Dublin. And every day she'd go and she'd work there until her food ran out. So she helped in a practical way. But she also travelled around Ireland and she left a very powerful account of what she saw during the famine. And she's a very honest witness. Much of Aston Nicholson's famine writings are full of graphic accounts of the immense death and suffering which she witnessed in her travels through famine-ravaged Ireland. For example, she wrote the following about her visit in the year 1847 to the island of Arranmore, situated off the west coast of County Donegal. Six men beside Mr Griffith crossed with me in an open boat and we landed, not buoyantly, upon the once pretty island of Aran Moor. The first thing that called my attention was the death-like stillness. Nothing of life was seen or heard except occasionally a dog. These looked so unlike others I had seen among the poor, I unwittingly said, How can the dogs look so fat and shining here where there is no food for the people? Shall I tell her, said the pilot to Mr. Griffith, not supposing that I had heard him. That was enough. If anything were wanting to make the horrors of a famine complete, this supplied the deficiency. Friends, I leave you to your thoughts and only add that the sleek dogs of Aaron Moore were my horror, if not my hatred, and have stamped on my mind images which can never be effaced. Asnet Nicholson spent nearly two years in famine ravaged Ireland doing her level best to bear witness to the suffering which she saw all around her, as well as to castigate those with power and means, who failed to do enough to alleviate the crisis. This is her story, the story of Astrid Nicholson and the Great Irish Famine. Astrid Nicholson, she came because of the famine. She came to distribute relief and then also to report back to colleagues in New York as to what she had seen. Astrid Nicholson, her main function was to highlight the need for relief and to draw public attention to it. And the press was inclined to listen to her as well. The fact that she could write well and publish her material and get the word out. She was sort of the media person of the day, if you like. She provided this very powerful witness testimony and through the eyes of a woman. She went into the poor, she investigated the conditions, she helped where she could, she got help where she could. The role of the eyewitness observer. Sympathetic journalists covering of famine conditions. She was trustworthy, so when she said things were as bad as they were, people took notice and that was very, very important to get that across. She bears witness to human suffering. She was such a forthright eyewitness.
and before we hear more about Aston Nicholson's work in Ireland, first we need to briefly investigate her roots. Professor Maureen Murphy of Hofstra University in New York State, and also author of the book Compassionate Stranger, Asnet Nicholson and the Great Irish Famine. She was born on the frontier, on the Vermont frontier, in 1792. Her people were English background. Her father's people landed near Plymouth in a place called Situate, now known as a place where the Irish were moss gatherers, of all things. Her mother was Martha Rice. Her parents married in Worcester, Massachusetts. Again, they would have known Irish who were in that area. And in fact, her father said to the children, remember, children, that the Irish are a suffering people. And when they come to your door, never send them empty away. Uh, her mother taught her. Her mother was a a, a woman who was a, a great worker, and uh, she said that the sun never looked down on me in bed when I was well. And Nicholson said later on, when she was working during the famine, she said she learned as a girl a lesson from her mother that you would not always have a covered carriage, and sometimes your meals would be cold, and sometimes they would be hot, and sometimes you would get a welcome, and sometimes you wouldn't get a welcome at all. But you must remember that you must be busy, your hands must never be idle. So she had those two things. Those two things being a strong work ethic and also a deep compassion for the poor. Also, Nicholson's independent spirit was evident early in her life. At the age of 16, she chose to leave home and work as a teacher, first in Vermont and later in a place called Elizabethtown in New York State. Nicholson was a school teacher and she gets to uh, Elizabethtown and runs her school. And down the street from the place where I think she ran her school was a, a widower whose name was Norman Nicholson. She married Norman Nicholson. She is, of course, Asenath Nicholson. He was a widower with three children. Uh, he was uh, a lawyer. He was a partner in probably the biggest law firm in that part of the world. During her time in Elizabethtown, Nicholson began writing journalistic pieces which condemned various corruptions in society. After a number of years, she and her family moved to live in New York City in and around the year 1831, where she opened up a reform temperance boarding house. Professor Margaret Kelleher, Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature and Drama at University College Dublin. It seems that she was a reformer. She was involved in the temperance movement in New York. She was involved in the anti-slavery movement. She was quite a, a fervent abolitionist, for example. And she ran a boarding house, in fact, perhaps a number of boarding houses, on behalf of Sylvester Graham, who was a reformer in the States in the early 19th century. And it seems that through those boarding houses in particular, she employed a number of young Irish women. And from her boarding house on the edge of New York City's crime-infested and disease-ridden Five Points slum, Aston Nicholson began working with impoverished Irish immigrants, who were then pouring into the city. Maureen Murphy. So when she goes to the Five Points, she is working on her own there. There are organisations largely evangelical Protestant groups down in the Five Points with these uh, kind of centers that were temperance and some education and some relief, that sort of thing. But Nicholson worked as she always worked on her own. But she tells us important inside of her, as she said, it was in the garrets and cellars of New York that I saw that the Irish were a suffering people. And that's the experience in the garrets and cellars of New York in the Five Points, where she makes up her mind when she has the opportunity, she will go to Ireland and personally investigate the condition of the poor. Why did she want to do that? The Irish were coming to New York at this point. And again, this is before the Great Irish Famine. I want to make a point, 10 years before the Great Irish Famine. And it's worth pointing out that it's believed that sometime in the late 1830s, Asnet Nicholson's husband died. A few years later, in the year 1844, she took her first visit to Ireland. 
She goes aboard a ship called the Brooklyn. Goes first, of course, to Liverpool, and then she lands in Ireland in May of 1844. She came to Ireland in 1844, and at that time, she really came to distribute Bibles in Ireland, but in a very gentle way. She didn't proselytize in the way we you know, think of superism. But she left. She left on account of being in Ireland. She was very moved by the poverty she saw. Professor Christine Keneally, and one of the key people whom Nicholson befriended during her first visit to Ireland was the famous temperance advocate Father Matthew, Maureen Murphy. Early in her journey south in 1845, she uh, ran into Father Matthew, and, and they caught up together in Cork. They were very, very good friends. She really appreciated what he was doing, and uh, he invited her to come and to visit. And she saw him, his work, among the poor of Cork. And he suggested, if you really want to see what Ireland is like, go to Bandon, go down there to West Cork or down to Kerry. And so she did, and that's when she began to see the poverty and she began to think of this endemic poverty. The further west she went, the further she saw, the before the famine, endemic poverty. And she saw a number of things. She saw lack of employment as a big problem, which led to endemic poverty, uh, substandard housing, of course. And then she identified the single food source, as something that would be, that would come home, you know, the chickens would come home to roost, as they say, that these are the word, the warning things. So in her book... The single food source, the potato. The potato, yes. The lumber potato. That's right, the lumber. And these are the things that she became part of her first book, Ireland's Welcome to the Stranger, which she actually wrote in 1847 to raise money for her later um, would have been based on her travels in 1844, pre-Irish yeah. famine, yeah. just the outbreak of the famine in That's 1845. Right. And it wasn't a Jeremiah. I mean, she, she, she's not saying, oh, oh you know, this is going to happen, I'm, I'm warning you. She's just pointing out things. In other words, Nicholson sensed the looming tragedy about to engulf Ireland. She left the country in August 1845, just a short while before the potato crop failed partially due to blight. In the following year, 1846, things chronically worsened, when the potato crop failed totally. Since millions of the Irish poor depended on the potato for their survival, they now faced starvation. And as debt stalked the land, Nicholson decided to return to Ireland to try help alleviate famine suffering. She arrived back into Dublin in December 1846. So what kind of city was she returning to? Historian Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. When she arrived in Dublin, she would have found it very much changed from her previous visit. Dublin it suffered from the famine, not in the way that the West did. It was very, very different. First of all, uh, the economy of the country had gone into a nosedive effectively. The famine was not just people starving, which obviously was the big issue, but it affected everything across the board. And so the economy goes down, so the functions of the city go down with it. Things like house building came to a halt or slowed down vert to a virtual halt. But that's to the econ- uh, economic side. From the human side, it was a city full of refugees. Because just as happens all around the world, when people have a major problem in their own area, a lot of people get up and leave to go and find something better. And this is what happened in Ireland in the 1840s. So Dublin was becoming a city crowded with poverty. And as historian Maureen Murphy touched on a short while ago, Astonit Nicholson wrote the book Ireland's Welcome to the Stranger about her first 1844 to 1845 visit to Ireland. 
Later she wrote another book, which is nowadays called Annals of the Famine in Ireland, in which she described her experiences during the Great Famine. For example, in the book she talks about her early days in Dublin, living temporarily in the house of her friend Richard Webb, as well as a certain court case, Maureen Murphy. She talks about being a woman who has been brought in to court because she was gleaning in a field. that She was found with these purloined greens, also cooking a dead dog to feed her family. I got this information from a friend shortly after my arrival in Ireland. A man had died from hunger, and his widow had gone into the ploughed field of her landlord to try pick a few potatoes in the ridge, which might be remaining since the harvest. She found a few. The landlord saw her, sent a magistrate to the cabin, who found three children in a state of starvation and nothing in the cabin but a pot, which was over the fire. He demanded of her to show him the potatoes. She hesitated. He inquired what she had in the pot. She was silent. He looked in and saw a dog with the handful of potatoes she had gathered from the field. The sight of the wretched cabin and still more the despairing looks of the poor silent mother and the famished children crouched in fear in a dark corner, so touched the heart of the magistrate that he took the pot from the fire, bade the woman to follow him, and they went to the courtroom together. He presented the pot containing the dog and the handful of potatoes to the astonished judge. The judge then called the woman and interrogated her kindly. She told him they sat in their desolate cabin two entire days without eating, before she killed the half-famished dog, that she did not think she was stealing to glean when the harvest was gathered. The judge gave her three pounds from his own purse, told her when she had used that to come to him again. This was a compassionate judge, and would to God that Ireland could boast of many such. And after a short while in Ireland, Nicholson moved from her friend's house in Dublin's outskirts and based herself in Dublin city centre, where she began running a soup kitchen. Overwhelmed by the magnitude of the hunger around her, she pragmatically committed herself to a particular group of families in Dublin's Liberties, for whom she gave Indian meal daily, as well as teaching them how to properly cook it. She lives in this narrow house above the Liffey, and every morning she gets up at four o'clock and she begins to correct the proofs for Ireland's welcome to the stranger. Her account of her travels in Ireland in 1844 and 1845, which her friend Richard Davis Webb will publish for her, it's published in England by Chapman and Hall and eventually in the United States by Scribner. But she's writing this book as a money spinner to get money to use to feed the poor. And she gets up every morning and she corrects proofs for that. And then she fills her baskets, two two baskets, with loaves of bread. And she walks through to her soup kitchen, which is on Cook Street, which was also sometimes called Coffin Street because the number of coffin makers on the street. And she operates out of that. And she teaches people to learn to cook Indian corn. The big issue with Indian corn for many starving people being that if they didn't cook it properly, then they could end up with dysentery and die. Margaret Keller. 
to ask Nicholson. A good instance of her pragmatism is that she went to people's homes and, for example, taught them how to cook Indian meal. You know, she talked about the fact that people found these new foods difficult to manage. And in one of her accounts, she talks about repeatedly actually going to a home to make sure that they knew how to cook. So there is that great sense, I think, of her pragmatism. Nicholson knew how to feed people. She knew how to feed housefuls of people. She was somebody who, when she recognised there was something to be done, you know, for example, teaching people how to cook Indian meal, she went ahead and did it. Cook Street, a place devoted almost entirely to making coffins and well known by the name of Coffin Street, was the field of my winter's labour. This was chosen for its extreme poverty being the seat of misery refined. So much a day was allowed to each family according to their number, always cooking it myself in their cabins till they could and did it prudently themselves. Also, the turf was provided and the rent paid weekly, which must be done, or, in many cases, turning upon the street was the consequence. As she worked in the spring of 47, she did have some funds, but one of the things that happened to her is that she ran out of money. She had reprinted a book that she, an early book of hers called Nature's Own Book, which was about vegetarianism. And of course, she wrote Ireland's Welcome to the Stranger. But she had gone through her money and she was despairing. Remember, she felt that she was on a divinely appointed mission, that God had sent her to do what she could for the poor and that she had no resources. And she talks about feeling just, she was just beside herself, that she had nothing left. Uh, Of course, she was very devout, and it would hardly be her style to question her divine uh, maker. But she said, why was I sent here if I couldn't do anything to help? And then providentially, from America, came the wrapped in the New York Tribune, the editor of the New York Tribune, a man called Horace Greeley, sent her money in a letter letting her know that there had been a meeting and that there was a New York a relief commission that were going to commit themselves to raising money. He sent her money, wrapped in the pages of the New York Tribune, which became her tablecloth, by the way. And she was so grateful. Indeed, so grateful that she immediately wrote a letter to the New York Tribune thanking its readers. The letter began. Dear Sir, I hasten with a grateful heart to acknowledge the receipt of your letter and the donations from yourself and those kind friends. Tell them ten thousand times do I thank them for the blessed boon of having it in my power. Yes, of having the most humble part in relieving the dying suffering around me. She had some money from a New York Relief Society, which she was distributing. She said, I can't save everyone, but I can save someone. She helped in a practical way. She starved herself, really, for the poor as well. I mean, she wasn't anorexic, and she ate what she did. And she always talked about if she got a free meal, she got a free meal because she could use the rest of the poor. She's happiest when she was working among the poor. just as important as working among the poor. Nicholson wrote about her experiences in famine Ireland to various publications, especially in her native USA. Such writings helped to highlight the plight of the starving Irish poor to the outside world. Rob Goodbody. She did a huge amount to raise money from outside the country and to spread the information about what was going on, to make people more aware, because awareness abroad was critical if the money was going to be raised to buy the food to distribute through soup kitchens and in other ways. 
For example, to the readers of the New York Tribune, Nicholson wrote. Could angels weep, they would do it now. No wonder the Immaculate Son of God sweat drops of blood in that memorable garden if he had sins to bear like this famine. If the black guilt of the rich aristocracy of the kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland were upon him. Asnet Nicholson ran her soup kitchen in Dublin until the summer of 1847, by which time the government's Temporary Relief Act, the so-called Soup Kitchen Act, became effective. Following this, she visited Belfast City, Christine Keneally. She went to Belfast and she encountered the Belfast Ladies' Committee, which was formed 1st of January 1847, and from the outset they said we will have no sectarianism on this committee. And one of their members, she was 79 years old, was Mary Ann McCracken, who was sister of Henry Joy McCracken, known for her very liberal progressive views, for her support for abolition. So she was on the committee and there was not going to be no sectarianism if she was on the committee. Her family was Unitarian. So this committee came together and they really gave without regard to religion. Most of the money they raised, they raised almost £3,000 in all. And she was full of praise for the way they were organising, the fact they were working so hard to get relief to the poor. Through Marianne McCracken, she goes to a family called Crimshaw, again, a cotton mill factory, actually cotton growers. And through there, she meets the daughter of people named Hewitson. Maureen Murphy. And they live in Donegal, and it's through the Hewitsons, through the daughter, that she's invited to go to the Hewitsons. And they both were involved in local famine relief. Mr. Hewitson was a British Army officer or pensioner, and he was overseer of Board of Works projects in the area. And Mrs. Hewitson ran the local soup kitchen. This industrious woman, Mrs. Hewitson, like Solomon's prudent wife, had not only risen while it was yet dark to prepare meat for the household, but she had been in her meal room at four in the morning, weighing out meal for the poor, the Society of Friends in Dublin having furnished her with grants. This, I found, was her daily practice, while the poor, through the day, made the habitation a nucleus not of the most pleasant kind. The lower window frame in the kitchen was of board instead of glass, this all having been broken by the pressure of faces continually there. After her visit to County Donegal, Nicholson made her way down south to County Mayo, where she witnessed and wrote about, to use her own words, misery without a mask. However, amidst such misery, her writings also record the odd moment of defiance. Maureen Murphy. You know, people talk about, and and we certainly hear this with the Holocaust, about resistance. Was there no resistance? And Nicholson talks about one example of this. And I think Liam O'Flaherty grabs this for his very historical novel, and he he knew his history for it, uh, Famine. But what she talks about is, again in Mayo, she sees a boy in Eris, and the drivers have come to get the livestock of the poor. On one side were the warlike drivers, and on the other the ragged, hungry, imploring people. When the flocks of animals were taken, all returned but one boy, whose age was about 14 years. He stood as if in a struggle of feeling till the people had gone from his sight and the drivers were descending the hill on the other side. Instantly, he rushed between the drivers and flock and before the mouth of their loaded pistols, he ran among the cattle, screaming and putting the whole flock in confusion, running hither and thither, the astonished drivers threatening death. The boy, heeding nothing but the main point, scattered and routed the whole flock. The people heard the noise and ran. 
The drivers, whether in astonishment or whether willing to show leniency, let their own hearts judge, rode away. The inhabitants exalted, and the flocks were soon in the enclosures of the owners. But that noble-minded heroic boy was the wonder, facing danger alone and saving for a whole parish what a whole parish had not dared to attempt. His name should never be forgotten, and a pension for life is his due. Throughout her famine writings and journalism, Asna Dickelson castigated those in power and government for failing in their stewardship of their relief resources. Margaret Keller. Some of the strongest political passages in her writings come from her denunciation of relief efforts. Uh, she was very critical of contemporary relief efforts for their inefficiency, for their bureaucracy. She sometimes really interviewed people, you know, who had found it impossible to get relief. So in that regard, her political beliefs, I think, were quite sharp. And one of the reasons she's quite an interesting commentator is that this is somebody travelling around Ireland at the time who names things as she sees it and, and in particular names the deficiencies of the relief system very squarely. An officer paid by the government was generally well paid. Consequently, he could take the highest seat in a public conveyance. He sought for the most comfortable inns, where he could secure the best dinners and wines. He inquired the state of the people and did not visit the dirty hovels himself, when he could find a menial who would for a trifle perform it. And though sometimes when accident forced him in contact with the dying and dead, his pity was stirred. It was mingled with the curse which always follows, laziness and filth, and he wondered why the dirty wretches had lived so long, and he hoped this lesson would teach them to work in future and lay up something as other people did. When his plan of operation was prepared, his shop opened and books arranged, and the applications of the starving were numerous, he preemptorily silenced some and sent them away without relief. Many had walked miles without food for 24 hours, and some died on their way home, or soon after reaching it. And when the story was told him, and he was entreated to look into the cases of such, the answer was that he must be true to the government and not give out to any whose names he had not entered into the books. If they died, how could he help it? If all government relief officers did not do precisely as has been stated, all manifested a similar spirit, more or less. But it wasn't just inefficient government relief efforts which Nicholson criticised. She also condemned any others whom she saw as failing the poor. Maureen Murphy. One of the other things she sees, in again in Mayo, right before Christmas in 1847, there is, uh, and we, we know, and she's very critical of absentee landlords, she's very critical of the government, she's very critical of the church who take stuff for themselves and don't use all their money for the poor, you know, who, you know, takes off the top their expenses. And of course, if they have wine with their meal, she really gets annoyed with them. But she uh, reports right before Christmas, I think it was the 23rd of December, she goes out and she sees that uh, families have been evicted and they're living under sort of kind of a tent fly. And uh, the place, of course, the little cabins have been tumbled. And she talks about seeing these people living in destitution on a cold, really cold winter night and holding on to their little bits and pieces. And she says, and readers, even the poor, have their little things that they cherish, you know. 
but she describes them. And this turns out to be a Dublin solicitor named Walsh. And he gets very annoyed that he's named as the proprietor who's evicted these people. Because, and again, Nicholson is, you know, she calls it, she calls them the way she sees them. And this guy is being as, as, as exploitive of, of the poor as anybody else. So he's very annoyed that he's he's named as somebody who would evict people. But Especially it's, just on the eve just of on Christmas. The eve of Christmas, yeah. The winter of 47, 48, she is in Mayo. When I went over desolate heiress and saw the demolished cabins belonging to Mr. Walsh, I beg to know if all had died from that hamlet. Worse than died was the answer. For if they are alive, they are in sandbanks along the bleak seashore, or crowded into some miserable cabin for a night or two, waiting for death. They are lingering out the last hours of suffering. O ye poor, ye miserable oppressors! What will you do when the day of God's wrath shall come? Have you ever thought what rock and mountain ye can call upon to screen your naked heads, who would not here give the poor and hungry a shelter? When the elements shall melt with fervent heat, then shall the blaze of these ruins scorch and scathe you, yea, burn you up, if you do not now make haste to repent. Ye lords, when the Lord of lords and God of gods shall gird on his sword, then shall these poor be a swift witness against you. In addition to cruel landlords such as the Dublin solicitor Walsh, Nicholson indicted many of the upper classes for their indifference to famine suffering. Maureen Murphy had this to say about a famous painting now hanging in Boston College in Massachusetts, which depicts the Irish gentry whining, dining and parting in Dublin Castle during the height of the Great Irish Famine. That picture of the Dublin, I think it's in the collection, the Burns Collection in Boston, Boston College, but it's a picture of a, a levy in Dublin Castle in 1848. You know, very fancy and what are people doing putting money into that when down the country, not too far away, people are starving and people are swarming into the city who are starving. The winters of 1847 and 1848 in Dublin were winters of great hilarity among the gentry. The latter season, particularly, seemed to be a kind of jubilee for songs and dances. As Neth Nicholson, she's a very honest witness. Nicholson was quite savagely critical of the injustices that she saw along the way. She was very critical of many landlords. She's very tough on people who put anything before helping the poor. The most important aspect of Nicholson is her castigation of inequality, her castigation of those who had and were not willing to distribute. Her account, it makes such powerful, powerful reading. And we don't have many women's voices from that period, so it's doubly useful and special because of her gender and because she was such a forthright eyewitness. And although Asnet Nicholson came from a strict Puritan background, nevertheless, she lambasted those in power such as Charles Trevelyan, who charged that the famine was caused by providentialism and was an act of God, not man. Professor Margaret Kelleher of University College, Dublin. It's very striking in her famine writings that, for example, she's caustic and castigates the view of famine as being caused by providentialism, for example. Um, She very firmly refutes that. 
and sees famine very much as man-made. There's a moment in her writings where she says, you know, never was there want or deficiency in the world where there was not plenty elsewhere to make up that deficiency. Ireland's famine was a marked one, so far as man was concerned. And God is slandered when it is called an unavoidable dispensation of his wise providence, to which we should all humbly bow as a chastisement which could not be avoided. She certainly would not have seen it as as divine judgment. She, she, and and she, I don't think she would have seen it as divine intervention. Professor Maureen Murphy of Hofstra University in New York State. I mean, if you read the English papers and you read Trevelyan, this is an opportunity for the Irish to get their act together and so forth. No, this would not be Nicholson at all. She would not see it as a divine visitation, and certainly she wouldn't see it as a judgment. But she did judge the British government for their failure of stewardship. Yes, unhesitatingly may it be said that there was not a week during the famine, but there was sufficient food for the wants of that week, and more than sufficient. Was there then a God's famine in Ireland in 1846, 47, 48, and 49, and so on? No. It is all mockery to call it so, and mockery which the Almighty will expose before man will believe and be humbled as he ought to be. Much of Aston Nicholson's famine writings focus on the many unsung famine heroes whom she met in her travels, including various ladies' relief committees, selfless clergy of all denominations, Coast Guardsmen and some resident landlords, whom she praised as compassionate and selfless. Maureen Murphy gives one example from Nicholson's visit to the town of Toome in County Galway. She goes to Toome and she visits the presentation convent there and she's astounded because she sees children with normal affect. She hasn't seen children like this. Uh, since she's returned to Ireland in December of 46. And now these are children that are behaving like children. And she knows, she's a school teacher, she knows. And she realizes that it's the presentation sisters who know how to feed the children, who know what to do, and they have fed them. The kids have come to school and they've been fed, and they have been educated. And she's also records that the presentation sisters have taught them a uh, kind of needle crafts and needle things to do so that they can begin to earn a living for themselves. So that becomes very important for her. But it wasn't just the selfless work of many Roman Catholic nuns such as those in Shum whom Nicholson extolled. She also lauded the famine relief efforts of many Protestant religious. A prime example being Francis Kincaid. Francis Kincaid, who was the Church of Ireland curate in Ballina in County Mayo. And Nicholson admired him for a couple of reasons. One, he was as concerned with the Catholic poor as with his own congregants. And the second is he worked very hard to provide employment. And like many other curates and landlord families, and we must say that on all of those helpers on their behalf, a lot of people died taking care of the poor who had contracted opportunistic infections like typhoid, tetanus, cholera, and so forth. But when he died in 1847, January of 1847, Catholics and Protestants came together to contribute to a memorial to him in his memory, which is still in the church in Ballina. If you're ever in the church of Ireland in Ballina, you can go in and see it. And this is what it said, to the memory of the Reverend Francis Kincaid, this tablet, erected by his sorrowing friends and the parishioners of Kilmore Moy, here for almost 10 years he labored with faithfulness, patience, and untiring zeal. 
Exemplary as a minister, he was in his daily walk a consistent servant of his heavenly master. When the famine came to Ireland, many clergy mobilized to help the poor and tend the sick untold numbers gave their lives victims of a fever an evil curse that spread with a vengeance through the country to leave a million dead and by the autumn of 1848 Asnet Nicholson was completely worn out from her nearly two years of famine relief work and activities. As a result, she bade a reluctant farewell to her beloved, Ireland, Maureen Murphy. She leaves the country in '48 because she said she couldn't bear to live through another winter. She couldn't bear to bear witness to another winter. She was, you know, she was, it was kind of battle, burnt out. Battle fatigue, burnt out, exactly. And after some time in England and the European continent, Nicholson eventually returned to her native USA in the early 1850s. Given her love for the Irish poor, it's perhaps not surprising that during the last few years of her life, she spent time working with impoverished Irish immigrants. We're told that she's working on the Brooklyn waterfront with Irish immigrants again. And then she mysteriously turns up in Jersey City in 1855 and dies on the 15th of May in 1855. Her death certificate says typhoid fever. Talking to medical friends of mine, they're not, con- they're not convinced it could have been typhoid fever. Of course, the last years of her life would have been years of real physical deprivation and emotional stress and suffering. She's buried in Greenwood Cemetery, which is the famous cemetery in Brooklyn overlooking the harbor. Asnet Nicholson spent nearly two years, 1847 and 1848, in Ireland, giving her all to try alleviate Irish famine suffering, and perhaps more importantly, bear witness via her writings and journalism to the plight of the Irish poor. So what was her ultimate contribution to Ireland? Margaret Kelleher. It's hard to estimate the full extent of her relief in that she was continually, for example, running out of money. She writes about a lot in her narrative and hoping for more money to come. I mean, she certainly distributed, um, you know, some food and some quite material advice to people along the way. Her famine work was first published in in 1850. So I think already we can see that perhaps, you know, her, I'm reluctant to say that that relief wasn't important because obviously the people she encountered, it was significant. I suppose on the scale of other relief schemes, it was minor. But it meant that as soon as 1850, her famine accounts were being circulated and those famine accounts continued to circulate you know, in in a broken way, but they continue to be available to this day. So there is that sense in which perhaps her primary importance has been really as ethnographer and in a way anthropologist of the Great Famine. At the end of the day, when people say to me, well, what did the Nicholson provide? I said she provided the record. She was the one. She was sent to bear witness. That's what she was sent to do. She believed she was sent to do something and do what she could to help the poor, and she did to the best of her ability. But to the rest of us, particularly 150 years later, she was sent to bear witness, and increasingly she is viewed both in Ireland's Welcome to the Stranger before the famine and Annals of the Famine. She is viewed as a voice that can be trusted, an objective, reliable voice about Ireland at the eve of the Great Irish Famine and during the famine itself. Maureen Murphy. Here's Margaret Keller. It's the role of the eyewitness observer. We're obviously familiar with that in our own time of the risks and dangers, you know, that people take in order to record 
crisis or catastrophe from first hand. And I suppose in that regard, her work is in a very strong tradition of journalists. I'm thinking of Fergal Keane's work, for example, in Rwanda. And until we meet again in some other hidden avenue of Irish history, I'm going to leave the last word with various contributors, talking about the big lesson which we can learn from Astrid Nicholson's work in Ireland during the Great Irish Famine. Rob, good body. Um, one lesson we can learn from what she did was that everybody has a part they can play in a disaster. What she did was to think to herself, what have I got that I can use to contribute to this? And what she was able to bring to it was her contacts, her enthusiasm and her ability to write. And those other people may have had different attributes and they go in a different way, but it's just a case of seeing what can I do? And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be somebody very wealthy with a lot of money to put into the cause or some other thing, just identifying what she could do and doing it and she did it very well when we hear a famine in the world today we should help we can't do everything but we can do something never was there want in the world when there was not plenty to make up the deficiency elsewhere our irish ancestors were helped so much in so many ways during the famine by people who had no connection with them or with ireland Yet they came to their rescue and they helped them to live. Even if we have no direct connection with people who are poor, who are suffering from hunger, we should still be willing to give. A girl born in 1792 Opening a school in New York State And marrying a lawyer well-to-do She shared a wish to help the needy Relief and reform would be her aim Establishing a temperance house of lodging Where immigrants and poor would feel no shame Asneth was the voice of the voiceless a brave and fearless lady in her day Bringing fresh hope to the hopeless people When suffering and famine came their way She provided cheap accommodation to serve the liberal purpose of reform To lead a moral life of help and service Courageously her hard crusade was born Her writings would express her condemnation Corruption 
and hirelings all despised. Thus providing service to the needy, officials who failed were criticised. Asnath was the voice of the voiceless, a brave and fearless lady in her day, bringing fresh hope to hopeless people when suffering and famine came their way. Following the death of her dear husband, she crossed the sea in 1844 to travel rural roads and country places to study for herself the Irish poor. Asneth was the voice of the voiceless a brave and fearless lady in her day, bringing fresh hope to hopeless people when suffering and famine came their way. Her mission was to publicize the famine and in the coldest winter of the year Her voice could be heard in Dublin city Serving hot soup with words to cheer Slating the idle wealthy classes who chose to always look the other way. She warned of unemployment's evil message and fought for a fairer, brighter day. She fought for a fairer, brighter day. Asneth was the voice of the voiceless, a brave and fearless lady in her day, bringing fresh hope to hopeless people when suffering and famine came their way. When suffering and famine came their way. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television license fee.